by the way, a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's also a pleasure to talk after Mathieu and after Daniel. Um, and I guess it ties up very well with what we were talking about. Is I've got, I'll be talking about how to make computation more physical. And I'll be talking about not having these tables because they're sort of external, but, but by putting technology onto you. And as I'm speeding up my speaking, do this if I speak too fast, because it's something I do with my students because I do speak too fast. All right. So just a little bit of a framing, because I much like Daniel, we usually speak at sort of HCI, human computer interaction conferences. And some of the things that I do are inherently academic. They inherently try to tease out very far future exploration. So just bear in mind that this is not sort of the next iPhone. This might be as well very stupid sort of, in a lack of a better word, or very strange interfaces. So let's pretend for a second that we're really far out exploring what HCI could mean in a far future. So I'm going to talk about wearable interfaces that talk directly to your body. I'm going to show you a first example, but I'll not explain it yet. So the, the fun thing here is that that slider is controlling my hand. It's not my hand controlling the slider. I'll just leave it like that. I'll explain it later. So why the hell would one create interfaces that talk directly to the body? Isn't it enough to have this, this thing, which already talks a lot to my body, my eyes, and so forth, and to my lap? So I'll give you like a run through of my last works and kind of each one I hope that inspires a little bit of a reason of why an interface by talking directly to the body could potentially be slightly different than the things that we have today either here or here or anywhere else. And the first one is a work that I call Muscle Propelled Force Feedback and sort of tries to end this notion of the digital metaphor. Every time we play a video game it's just digital so it's always just a digital metaphor. So this is sort of the first uh, work that I did uh, with my colleagues at HPI. And here, the funny thing is that this device is actually controlling your muscles. It's actually making your muscles move. We do that by using electrical muscle stimulation. So those electrodes that you see there are actually sending medically compliant and safe signals to my body and causing my muscles to move in return. Something like that, that it just moves one finger. And if you remember going to video games in the 90s and they like move around and stuff at the video game arcade, this is what you have, but in a smartphone. When that windmill force comes, it actually moves your muscles against your other muscles. You have to f force fight those two forces, and that's what's called force feedback, is when you're kind of fighting with one hand another force. And it's sort of a very interesting experience. Now, that technique, sending electrical impulses onto your muscles, which then cause them to move, is not something that we've invented. This has been something that you can actually do at a doctor's if you have muscle fatigue or something. And it's, it's been around in rehabilitation medicine since the 60s. What's interesting is that by doing that, we have this sort of very minimal device that has no motors or no mechanical actuators. And the hard thing is, Sean, uh, sorry, as, as Daniel pointed out, with mechanical actuators is that you get this big table, right? It's hard to make that table a little bit smaller. So the same exists for force feedback. This is how other researchers across the world create mobile force feedback. They put an exoskeleton around them. This is a huge contraption, rods, motors, a big battery that you don't even see right now. And it sort of gets in the way. If you want to have this experience, I would not like to have it with an exoskeleton. Now, on the other side, just by putting the electrodes on in very small hardware, because that's just a little bit signal, signal board generates the signals and so forth, you get sort of that, that kind of experience. So now it's sort of jumped to 2015, right? Now everybody's really excited about VR. What can this do to the notion of us experiencing these digital metaphors as physical? So jump into virtuality. And that's my uh, next project actually called Impacto. And let's pretend that uh, for a second, this is what we have at home. Our typical virtual experience, we're all very privileged, we, one must add at this point. We have this huge screen, and just to make it, this is you, or me as well. And when you're playing a, a virtual game, or you're playing a virtual experience, a simulator, it doesn't matter. There's always between you and a virtual you. That's a digital you represented on the screen with an avatar. And an experience is believable as long as you're kind of in that loop and in this case it's a video game, but that digital you and you are sort of talking so fast back to each other that you sort of forget for a second and you're like, wow, I'm Harry Potter in that Harry Potter game. Now, 2015, so Oculus Rift, headsets for everyone, virtual reality, you see in 3D. Suddenly, you're really Harry Potter. Now, being in that loop is called being immersed. It's kind of believing that reality. 
And, and as, as long as your, your body follows, or, or better to say, as long as that physical, virtual avatar follows your physical gestures, because there's motion sensing cameras, because there was accelerometers in your body, and when you move, that virtual avatar moves exactly the same way, you kind of believe in that experience, because the avatar is following your body. How could that not be one and the same thing? Now, the problem is then when that digital you over there hits a tree branch, the Harry Potter kind of thing hits the tree branch, and nothing happens to you. At that moment, you kind of snap out. Your brain is really good at detecting patterns, and it will just snap out and say, like, that thing hit a tree branch, and the arm of the virtual avatar moved, but my arm did not move. This is a virtual experience. This is all false. So at that point, you kind of lose that immersion. Right? You, you felt nothing, right? And poof, immersion lost. So our take on this is actually to try to generate the sensation of impact in virtual reality. And what you see here is my colleague Xi Jing, and he's playing sort of a boxing simulator. And when that boxing avatar hits him, he actually feels those punches. And the way we trick your brain into feeling these two components, tactile, something touched your arm, and there was a force transmitted onto your arm, that's extremely important as well. And we do them separately. There's a little solenoid that just taps your skin, does nothing but to tap your skin. And as you've seen before, the muscle stimulation does nothing but to move your arm. When you combine those two, your brain will think there was a tactile spot, something touched me right here, and that something had enough mass to move my arm backwards. And in virtual reality, because you see nothing else, you don't see all the wearable device, it actually feels like somebody hit you. And of course, you can, you can hit back, right? You just add a solenoid to your, to your knuckles, and you can also feel your own punches. All right. So, the key to simulate this notion of impact, and again, to not use an exoskeleton or a gigantic robotic 3D arm that would actually hit you and probably cause a lot of damage, is the muscle stimulation again. The muscle stimulation is replacing that gigantic robotic exoskeleton, and it's also what allows that little tactile component that just touched you, the solenoid, to be really small. Because if you didn't have that big muscle stimulation, that at a, a very small form factor causes already a lot of motion, you would have to not use that middle solenoid that we use. You'd probably have to use something even bigger that with more battery power and so forth and could never be mobile. And in reality, once we measure our solenoid, that's something like 200 grams, one kilogram. That's nothing compared to even me pushing this table right now, so much less a professional boxer hitting me. Now, what I find cool is that at this point, we can kind of break away from all these interfaces that you see and when you Google for, you know, Google Images wearable devices, everything is from the torso up, which I find extremely boring because, you know, bicycle, again, a great metaphor, it happens on a whole body. You're pedaling and so forth. Why there's no interfaces that attach to the foot, for instance. So here we're going to demonstrate a little bit of that by just transforming that boxing into Thai boxing, which means that it's legal to kick people. And once you kind of touch the opponent with your feet, your foot actually curls back, it feels the muscle stimulation, and you feel that as well in your toe. Same thing if you want to teach somebody how to juggle a football. And he, of course, is actually seeing a virtual football, the correct size of a football. And when that hits the foot, this one is very believable. It kind of feels really like there's something there. All right. And, and of course, now you can get even a bit more interesting because an impact of those two components, right? The one that touches you and the one that moves you back. What if we take one to the user and another one not to the user, we use something else? So what if we just partially attach that to the user? Now I have this kid. We can just watch this part again. So if we sort of partition that, we can actually generate normal physical objects that are not mechanically actuated, but they feel mechanically actuated. So CJ here is holding nothing, it's just like a little rod. It's not a baseball. But because the solenoid is now hitting that rod, it feels like the baseball actually hits that rod, and his muscles are doing the impact backwards. So you can kind of emulate objects that would move by themselves and whatnot, just by sort of partitioning that cleverly and tricking the brain. And that doesn't really matter. That's what you're doing for that. Um, what I do want to 
stressed out about the implementation because I think whenever I give these talks and I don't put this part, people go home and then they write me emails saying, oh, this is really hard to do and whatnot. It is not. It's extremely easy because computation reached a level and, well, we should also be at the makers panel right now, but you, you know that these things can be done because it just became very accessible. So to, to inspire you or to hopefully inspire you, I'll just show you a little bit sort of a high level of what this is actually in between. It's an Arduino. It's a Bluetooth. It's the electrical stimulator that you get from your doctor. And uh, I started actually giving workshops on these things to make sure that people understand how to work on this part, how to like be more transparent about this, how to not hack it in a, you know, hack it in a positive way, but not to change the medically compliant part, because that's a good thing. It's not going to harm you. If don't touch that part. Um, potenti digital potentiometers, which is actually what we use to, to manipulate that batteries and the accelerometer, which I'll talk about in a second, and the solenoid and the electrodes. To track the user skeleton, we're just using a very simple approach. It's just a Connect One uh, camera, which does really good skeleton tracking. You could also imagine just using accelerometers or something else. Um, and, the, and the applications were developed into Unity, which is also some sort of very affordable maker tool today. So if you just feel like you want to do something like this, you can totally do it right now. Please believe me on that one. And, um, so what happens is when the boxer collides with your skeleton in that virtual reality program developed in the Unity 3D, it's actually just sending a Bluetooth message to the impactor bracelet with all the parameters like the force of that hit and, and what arm should it activate or what feet or something like that. And that just happens. Um, the accelerometer is there for also a cool reason because the, the tracking would not get the foot tilt like that, foot tilt like this direction. Um, so we actually get a reliable measure by just hiding an accelerometer uh, in the bracelet so you can actually play that football application. But that will also allow you to, if you want, to play further applications. So why doesn't the talk stop here? Because I could, right? From a technical perspective, this is already something interesting and new. My, my, my story could be like, yeah, we made force feedback mobile, no more exoskeletons for everyone. That's really cool. But in reality, I think there's something more interesting about these two interfaces is that they Unlike the exoskeleton, they use your body as an interface. They actually lend or borrow part of your body to do that, your muscles in this case. And that is very, from a philosophical perspective, that is very interesting, right? Your body is sort of becoming a device. So to tease that out further, I'm going to back, go back to that original video that I showed, and it's called for perceptive interaction. And this time, I'm actually going to explain. So here are the device is actuating my muscles. It's moving as to represent some data. It could be, you know, your stocks, it could be how many emails you have, whatever you want to represent, it's just data. I can also move that, so when the slider turns green, it's me moving. If the data has changed again, the interface can just, you know, inform me once more, hey, there's like new stuff coming in, here's, you know, page ranks on my website or whatever your ego wants to believe. Now, the interesting thing about this wearable interface is that it's kind of small in the sense that you can wear under your clothes. And unlike most wearable interfaces out there, I think it does something that is a little bit interesting, which is it does input and output. So you don't need anything else. You can talk to the computer, instruct it to do stuff, sell these stocks, this part of the stocks. Or the computer can say, Here, here's the stock value. So to input, you just move your wrist. And there's an accelerometer there, so the computer knows you're moving your wrist. To output, the computer moves your wrist, the same thing. To do that, it uses the electrical muscle stimulation, which makes your wrist move. So when me and Patrick, my advisor, we started this project, we were super excited all over the place. And we were like, wow, we've made this you know, device over there in the, in the right side, and it's so interesting, it's wearable, and no, 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 no. And then we realized, and both look at each other, actually, that's, that's, not, that's not true. That thing on the right side is just a piece of technology to represent the muscle stimulation and the input and the processing power, blah. But the true device, is the wrist, is the human body. That's what the computer uses to talk to you. That's what I talk, used to talk to the computer. So it became a bit different. And so the, the typical way that th these devices work, these proprioceptive interaction devices, is that much like you do in normal life, you think, you move your muscles with your nerves, and you feel that through a sense in your body called proprioception. That's a sense that allows you to do this in the back, and you know exactly how your hand is posed, because that's just how your muscle fibers work. They inform back to your brain what, what just happened. Now the device has a proprioceptive sense of its own in the sense that it knows where your hand is with the accelerometer, right? And then when it wants to talk to you, it moves your wrist by the electrical muscle stimulation. And again, your wrist is being moved. Oh, that's really strange. You feel that immediately. 
And you feel that again through the proprioceptive sense. And that's why we kind of started naming it proprioceptive interaction, because it does this strange second pass there. So that is the notion that, and it's a far-fetched one, of course, you won't like do everything in life with this, but that's the notion that rather than you know looking at or feeling the vibration of your phone or hearing your text-to-speech on your phone or your computer, you do everything solely by the pose of your body. You do a pose to command something, and you receive a response by your body being posed by the computer. And here's an example, M not that far from what I'm doing right now, I'm giving a talk and I want to keep my eyes on the audience and a video is playing, but I also want to know where that video is right now. And as the video moves, my hand just moves like slowly upwards, upwards. And if I push it back, push my hand down, the video rewinds because the video and my hand are sort of synced in time. All right. And in reality, I'm all doing that with the cover on, but in, 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 the, in the background, there's this sort of not so powerful, but very interesting and very small, I think that's what's interesting, um, input and output device. So what you've seen was that my wrist was acting as a shared channel. Computer, human, using the same channel. That doesn't need to be, it's kind of easy to imagine. Okay, you know, I can say like, computer, you go left, I go right. And you kind of partition your body and say, you take that limb and I take that one. Let's see what you can do. And I loved like old games and children's games. And this is the slapsies game. You know, you play with two players, you gotta slap the other player, but you can play alone now. And this is Patrick trying to win at that, but it's very hard actually. And it's exactly the same hardware as you've seen before. The only difference is that in order to score how many hits Patrick won or lost, we just put a little microphone there and if his hands slapped, then the computer was able to slap him. If not, then he avoided, and we just keep on the score. All right. Um, another game that I love from the 70s is Pong. And here's my colleague Alex, and she's playing Pong for one, and she's imagining where the ball would go, because there's no real ball there. The cool thing about Pong is that the physics are really basic. So if her, for a computer hand is outwards, that means it's going to go there. She just needs to go with the other hand really fast and the accelerometer will measure if she got there fast enough to shoot another ball and another ball. Yeah, and here you see the idea again of this asymmetric interaction where you kind of lend part of your body to become an output device and the other one is an input device. All right, so we're getting close to the end. Um, the next thing I looked at was, what if we apply the same paradigm, right, kind of manipulating the user as the user is interacting, but we put an object in between. So it's not just your hand and your hand, it's just an, your hand and an object in between. And that allows you, it's called a Fortinus plus plus the next project, allows you to kind of play around a little bit with some designer notions. And, and one that I really enjoy is playing around with the notion of affordance. So I think most of you probably know, but I'll just keep it simple. Affordance of an object is how, I'm trying to search a nice object. There we go, beautiful object is how well designed this object is gonna to communicate to me its form. And this one is a pretty good one because it's not humongously big so I know I can grasp it because it's within the grasping radius of my hand. Same goes with the spray can. I can grasp it, I see a button, cultural reference, I probably can squeeze it, something's gonna come out, hopefully it's ink. But nothing except in the tiny you know, label of the spray can says you gotta shake before you use. And one could immediately just like blame the designer. What the hell, the spray can is a horrible design. It's not because it's very hard to depict something that is inherently time, right? Shaking is something that happens in time and all the designer could do is create that, that shape. If that sh spray can was animated using something like Inform, then it could depict time because Inform is mechanically actuated. So, but, whoops. But to put Inform in all the spray cans around the world, something like what Daniel did is a little bit hard. So. I'm gonna show it to you is doing the reverse, is putting the mechanics in you and just keeping the spray can a basic spray can. So here's a user study. So this is footage from people coming to our lab and we just told them, hey, can you like paint those shapes over there with this spray can and put these electrodes on? And obviously they were not aware that these things were going to happen. Also, it turns out that everybody, nine, uh, 11 out of 12, forget to shake. Interesting psychological study as well. I like this one. It tells me to shake. So 
the notion here is sort of making it a foreign dynamic in, in being able to communicate it because it could also change over time, right? If that spray can just becomes empty 10 minutes later, you can just create another gesture that says, I'm empty, flips it around, throws it to the garbage, recycling bin or whatever. And if you think that traditional affordance was limited, then this one is the plus plus because it's not just so limited. It can communicate more. It can communicate things that happen in time. All right. So I'm just going to skip through this a little bit and show you another example that I really like. This one is a super awkward tool. If you can buy it, because it's actually a really great tool. It's a, it's a patterned tool. It's an avocado slicer, three in one, it's called. And that's all we said. Eat this avocado. Okay, this is nice. See, the tool is rejecting to be used at that point and trying to flip the hand. And now she's like, oh, there's something else here. And now it shows the scooping motion. And now she does it. approached it and it kind of made, it gave me this motion and then I just applied it to the, to the avocado. All right, just applied it to the avocado. It can also sort of change dynamically the forms of things based on something that happened to the object. Again, of course there was a trick in here and we just asked them to drink this water, please. Okay, I feel like it doesn't want me to touch the water. sizes to actually make a drink or anything. So hot? <laughs> so she actually got it, right? That was the trick. I, I, in another room, adjacent room, I poured hot water in it. I waited until the steam went out. Really crazy setup. And then I went with this cup and the contents were too hot. So here the Fortin's Plus Plus is kind of trying to help you understand that that cup can actually have two affordances, the affordance of a glass or affordance of a cup, which can be held by the ear, and it can just switch dynamically between them depending on the state. So, kind of wrapping this up, if we put all this together, the key element is there is really that notion of me being creepy and interacting with that thing, which we call proprioceptive interaction, because it's the notion that you can interact, input and output, just through the pose of your own body. And once you kind of plot what, what HCI is usually, and this is probably a laptop or a tablet, and you can imagine computers, mainframes, everything before, you see that the interface size is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And a lot of people in my field were sort of saying, well, you can actually stop at the smartwatch, because at that point, there's no more visual interface. So there's very little input and output that you can do at that point. But in reality, if you consider the whole body as an interface, or as a display, or as an input surface as well, there's things like this and other things that people have done in the field as well that are very inspiring that kind of talk a little bit about post wearables. These are not just things that you use, but things that are you in a sort of a way. So they allow for very realistic experiences as well. So almost at the end, I just need to, to thank because I couldn't do this all by myself. This is Alex and Vili, Daniel, Patrick, uh, Sijing, and my advisor Patrick Bodish at the HPI. I'm happy to take your questions. And I already see one question. I can't really see you, but yeah. I think it's uh, all right. Deborah, I was uh, wondering that uh, you mentioned that uh, this is a medical device that mm -hmm. if, you, if you try to make your own, because I, uh, I used this uh, dance stimulating device before, and uh, I found it's really hard to uh, make the muscle move, move as you want. It's like mm -hmm. in your examples where you use it precisely as a slider, yeah. but in reality it's very individual. And yeah. So, I, I think I, I think your question has sort of two answers. One is maybe the hidden part, and I should make that more clear. Everything here was calibrated for like at least twenty to thirty minutes before use, in the sense that very very, very nice insight. Your your own muscles are very individual. They change over time as you get tired. It's just the same as riding a bicycle. You have to put more force when you're almost getting to work than when you just started, and. Over time, this whole thing will decalibrate. So I think if this ever becomes an interface of the future, this has to dynamically also recalibrate as you're using it. Um, with regards to making your own, the circuits are not that complicated. It's just that 
if you make one that is not tested with like sort of industrial setting, you might at some point screw up something that then will get into your body and that's where, where it gets tricky. But there's not that much to play actually, it's just the voltage, the intensity and the frequency, the, well, intensity, the frequency and the pulse duration. So using your own or using one that just allows you to manipulate those three parameters is the same. I think what you're hinting at, and it's a very good point, is the placing of the electrodes has to be very precise. Um, I don't know if you ever realized that, but if you place two electrodes here, when you twist your arm, they are now in the wrong place because your arm moves differently. So the inner, the inner workings of the arm move and the skin does not move. So all these things, and they will not actuate the wrong muscles. Um, so all these things have to be sort of taken into account and it becomes very difficult to do these interfaces in a precise way. I don't think any of those is precise actually. <laughs> it's just, they're all sort of crude and raw. More questions? I saw another arm, but I don't know where it was. Yes? Besides all those experiences that you are doing, like uh, what can go wrong, and uh, I mean, at the end, you are using machines that may have like faults and vulnerabilities, uh, and that's what I wanted to ask you about. I, I believe you have been thinking about uh, the implications, the security implications that these technologies mm -hmm. have, and whether, uh, what is your approach about it? Are you discovering new things? that you can kind of like um, consider very valuable to share or are you kind of like delegating it for others who might uh, kind of like make it secure? Yeah, so I, I, I don't believe in delegation in the sense that I think one should always consider what's working on. Of course, in a matter of time, I sadly don't have anything time, so I do delegate some things. But the reason why I, maybe in the last two years I started giving workshops and teaching people how to build slash um, modified the stimulators is exactly because I was always doing my research. I was also going to forums and seeing people sort of using them either in the electrical engineering way, wrong, but it was going to happen something bad, or in a very easeable, easy, easily hackable way, uh, as in security protocols or nothing, no security at all, or just the, the, the normal Bluetooth stack and things like that. So that's sort of my mechanism of sharing is to start actually getting engaged with people and doing doing these workshops. And I do one like every two months or something like that. So. Has been has been very fruitful in the sense of, of, of teaching people. Now I'm also thinking how to make uh, how this would even become secure because that's a very very complicated question. Um, maybe some inspiration there is that the fact that some devices nowadays um, are open hardware, so you actually know what security layers are running within, but they implement security at the hardware level. Like um, newer FPGAs do that, so maybe that could be an interesting way to tackle the problem. Actually, your bracelet already has encryption and not only allows you to talk to it. But we know these things can always be sort of hacked. So that's something to keep in mind at all times. Um, as a final message, maybe that's another layer of my work. It's also, to, it allows us, because these are no, not devices that are ready to ship at, at all, so it allows us sort of to think of future devices. Do we want them and how could they look like and so forth. So it's like, it's sort of a preemptive discussion. It allows us to have the discussion before we should, we should too far in it. Yeah, it's a good question. So much loved. So since you were saying uh, ah, this allows you to think to. Of, if you want to add that, mm -hmm. what is your personal opinion? Would you Yeah, so that's that's a that's a golden question. <laughs> yeah, I I Posayo the Yeah, that was a code name is Posayo, this one. I think it's I designed it because I that was very, very egoistic. I designed this for me. I think this device is exactly what I would enjoy having in the, in, the, in the sort of metaphor that you use that making computers more physical is sort of the interesting way to go about them rather than making them even more hunting experiences. Um, and again, I don't think I would use Posai for everything in my life, but I think a lot of the things would be way more beautiful and I would engage more with people if I could still do those things sort of as a, as a physical experience and not as a, as a digital kind of secluded experience. The other ones, I think partially they will happen, but I'm not exactly sure in which conditions and how would they happen. I like them all, obviously. <laughs> no, I'd love to see them all happen. All right, there's no more questions. Thank you so much for your attention.